So in this video, I wanted to go for a sum up um, everything we've been talking about so far and um, describe how to sort of build a prototype version 1.0 uh, general AI uh, with the different concepts and whatnot that I've been describing. So, um, one important thing to distinguish before I get into this is that so far I've been sort of describing two um, uh, different technologies. So there's virtual HTML and then there's um, sort of the uh, general AI. And um, so virtual HTML um, allows you to uh, easily build any type of web application that you want to build. And so you could, because all you have to do is um, uh, provide the unique little bits of HTML and JavaScript that are unique to your application, and then it can be um, build out the rest uh, of everything else that you need to uh, save the state of your application to um, uh, create uh, databases and save uh, that kind of stuff to allow other people to um, collaborate and view the same uh, document at the same time and all of this type of thing. You can have all of this uh, <clears throat> technology integrated in a way that um, it makes it easy to make web applications. So you could use that to make web applications like uh, Facebook 2.0, or you could use it to make um, whatever web application. And uh, uh, another web application you could make is this um, general AI, prototype 1.0. So So what does that look like? Okay, so here I'm just using Google Sheets or Excel or whatever um, to just illustrate what a computation would look like. Um, but it wouldn't necessarily be uh, an Excel interface or whatever. Um, so any computation you do, it has an input and an output. So when we get from the input to the output, your translator. Translator just takes a data that's in, in one format and translates it so that the data is in some other format. And any piece of software can be defined as just a series of translators all attached to each other, either like in a straight line or in like a weird mishmash. And so for any computation we want to make, first we need an input. And so our input could be um, text, image, could be um, video, file. Maybe something have in our clipboard that we paste. It could be um, maybe it's our, our web camera. Maybe it's our microphone. Maybe it's uh, like the mouse, the keyboard, whatever. 
we have all of these different inputs, and so that's where we start a computation. And so, um, as an example, something you of course seen is uh, you have Google, right? And the input is text, and then it translates that into a list of ten results on the web. Um, And so in this system, what happens like with text, Google, right? If we just would follow this, Google isn't the only thing you, you want to do with text, right? Maybe with text, you want to um, uh, translate it to French. Maybe you want to um, uh, spell check it. Maybe you want to do something really simple, like um, convert it to uppercase. Maybe you want to um, wait. There's a whole number of things you could do with, with the text input, and so if you're starting a computation, you, you type in some text. The first thing the system has to do is uh, present to you. different possibilities for the, uh, the computation you want to make. So you type in the text and it shows well, all the possibilities that you can do with the text input. Or well, we can give it these outputs. We can give you an output in a Google search. We can give you the output in French. We can give you the output in spell check. We can give you the output in uppercase. And then you choose which one you want. And then it learns based on the input what you chose as the output and then the next time you come to do the next computation you want to make it learned from the time before what you want to do with the input and so over time it can have intelligence about what type of computation you're trying to make. So let's say we're doing an image. Right, we put an image in and we could open that image in Photoshop. We could um, take that image and convert it to black and white. Take the image and we could modify the metadata and put on a little uh, GUI to modify the metadata in the image. We could um, detect faces in the image. Um, And so it's really cool, like, you don't have to stop at one computation, right? So, like, I take an image and I detect the faces. Well, now these faces that I've detected is my input. And so now I can take these faces and I can... Um, Um, blur the rest of the image, right? I could uh, uh, look them up in a da database. Um, and so on. 
and this isn't just the case for high-level computations for low-level stuff too. It, it's it's the same. So like. So, right, maybe our input is an integer. Um, well, an integer, we could convert that to a string. We could uh, multiply it by a value. We could... Um, Right, we can convert it to a string. We can take the string and we uh, now we need to dis display it on the screen so we can convert that to an image. An image with a, a string in it, we run that through OCR. <laughs> Whatever, but. but um, and so every piece of software, even on the the low level of it, can be represented in this in this system. Right? Like have the well, you're right, like that's just like an example of a basic function. But like, say you have your main your main function, right? Like the, First thing you have to do, you have to load the settings right from the disk, and then you um, you load your your GUI layout. You draw your layout on the screen. To convert it to um, audio tag. And so you, it, you can not only just run software through it and have it recognize all of these different patterns and different computations where you also do higher level um, just using the computer day-to-day -day computations and train on those as well. Okay, so hopefully that shows how you can create this intelligent sort of system um, by thinking about the everything as translators and, and chaining them together. Um, and so, so, like I was saying earlier, the this is sort of like a, a 1.0 um, general AI. Um, because you can give it something and figure out what you want to do while you're trying to compute and have a lot of intelligence about what that is. Um, which is really cool. So, something you could build on top of this is. Um, what I described in my video with the copycat AI. And so, what would that look like in this context? 
So, assuming you're building this system um, on top of virtual HTML, um, then the first version of Copycat would likely be copying um, web pages and web applications. What we have is the input is the browser window that you're using. And so that browser window has HTML loaded in it. And That HTML, we convert it, we translate it to virtual HTML. <clears throat> and so now we've copied the page. into virtual HTML and now we can um, add on all of these uh, different features to allow it to save state and all of these other cool things um, and And we can take advantage of all the things in virtual HTML. You can uh, fork copies of the code and, and change it, modify it. You can um, yeah. So you're you're copying it and then you're making it making it better. But then you don't stop there, so you need source code. And so I'm just playing with open source software. We take the source code and then we um, Kind of need source code to build up the intelligence of the system. Um, in this one point I'm thinking in general, but so another it maybe would be a binary, right? So there's maybe a Photoshop.exe and. Uh, So we take that and we run it through a program like Ghidra, right? And it goes and converts it to the source code. And then now, of course, you can't exactly do this today because Giza doesn't produce perfect binary source code, but we can build another intelligence to be able to do that. Um, but the idea remains the same. We do that and we can disassemble it and we can convert it to the source code. And we take the source code and we can feed that into. system and what's so cool about this like 
the um, my favorite feature in Photoshop is the color mix, the color picker. Like out of all of the color pickers and every piece of software. Photoshop is just the best. I just think it's the best. But I can only use it in Photoshop. And... Like, the color picker... At the end of the day, it just outputs, like, hex, right? Or it outputs... An RGB color. And... So, like, if I'm in Microsoft Word... And... Why do I have to be constrained to the Microsoft Word color picker? I just need to, ch to choose... An, an input... I'm trying to choose an... <laughs> I need to get a color, so... Why can't I just go and get the, pho the Photoshop one? Now, there's no technical reason that you can't do that. Like, we have things like the DLLs, Dynamic Link Libraries, and Windows. Other operating systems have similar systems to allow this, like, interoperability of, of code. But... There's just, like... Seems to be more of a diplomatic issue more than than a technical one, right? Like the, the color picker, all it does is it outputs hex and RGB, and so like <laughs> why does it have to run in the context of the Photoshop only, right? And and that goes the same for like every algorithm, every everything, and every and every application. Like what's also cool about the system, like you don't even have to to go this route and get to the source code from the binary. Right, we should be able to go. From the binary and Maybe you have to run it and observe it in memory, but like if you if you observe the binary running in memory, well now the memory is your your input, right? And so and then you can watch the data. see the data structures in the memory and you translate that into what their decombobulated memory structures are and then you can watch and see as they change and then figure out well what translator was used to change the data from this form to this form And then you can reverse engineer and figure out how the software works without having to to do this this disassembly. You just run the code, watch it, see what it does, poke it around, and you can figure out all of the algorithms.
Could even get more advanced. Um, depending on your sort of translator library and your library of how you link all the translators together. So, like, your input could be a video of someone using a piece of software. And from the video, you're able to see, well, when they click, the, the screen changed in this way. And then you can figure, well, what translator was that that would have caused the screen to change that way. And so you don't even need a binary of the software. You just need a video of someone using it. And I can figure out how it works. And it doesn't just have to be software, right? This is everything. Every computation you want to make is, is like this. Let's say you want to generate a movie, right? So my input is the like the one line uh, tagline of the movie, like sort of like the one line plot of the movie. And well, that gets translated into a bunch of brainstorming sessions. Brainstorming. And Those brainstorming sessions get translated to a rough draft of a script, right? The rough draft of a script gets translated to the first draft. It gets translated to a storyboard. And that gets translated to a series of tapes. And that gets translated to your first edit and so on and so on but you can't start there that's way too I think that's way too complicated you have to start with this like the low-level software HTML and keep building it up from there generating a um, a movie from scratch but then like you want to uh, like make make more episodes of your favorite TV show right so that you take in all the TV episodes and then that gets translated to things like your characters. Your characters, your um, your plots, your um, your themes, your sets, your the three D models of the sets. Um, that you can piece together from watching the video. Um, and then from 
here, you now you have this as your starting point to go, and you have your one line, and you go through your brainstorm, and you're up, and you're using, now you're using all of this data that you've, like, reverse engineered out of all of the TV episodes that you've fed it. Feed it all your favorite TV shows and have it make more of them for you. Eventually. <laughs> um. So with a system like this, you can basically do anything. Software development is so much easier and quicker because you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. You're just building on top of what other people have already made before you. Um, and not only that, you can write software easier, but then you can also just use a computer easier. You can get stuff done and not have to fill and futz around with software and trials and sign up forms. And I'm just like, well, this software company doesn't want to talk nice to this software company, so those. Even though they're in the same business, that their stuff can't commingle together. And, uh, I guess rid of all of that, and anyone want to build it? <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be really fun. 